Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Lanier. My business is Organizing for Good, and I'm so excited to bring you the nonprofit shout out interview this week. All month long, we are supporting Austin Kids Can. This is a circling back. We interviewed Donna Raskin last year. So I love to circle back and kind of find out what's what's new or different and um, how they've gotten through this crazy time and where they're going in the future. So welcome to this, welcome back to the show, Donna. Thank you very much, Ryan. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Donna is founder and executive director of a very young nonprofit called Austin Kids Can. Well, you just tell us a little bit about how you started it and what, what do you guys do? Well, okay, I'll start out with what we do and then I'll tell you about how it got started. Great. Um, Austin Kids Can, we are an after school provider with AISD schools uh, for elementary school children who are economically disadvantaged. And we provide programs in computer science and coding and in social emotional learning for those that would not have that opportunity uh, if it wasn't for the funding of Andy Roddick Foundation and our classes. Um, so currently we are in class teaching 50 students total in two schools, Hart Elementary and Harris Elementary. And we are thrilled to be back in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic that just lasted forever uh, was really a damper on our operations just because uh -huh. our whole thing is to be with the students and to uh -huh. teach them in person uh -huh. and especially with computer science coding it's really not easy to teach that virtually yeah so um but things are looking up uh we are in our spring semester and we have as i said 50 students a lot of them uh girls probably maybe 40 percent girls 60 percent boys um so we're excited about that and many i would say 98 percent probably 100 percent uh are economically disadvantaged children mm -hmm. that uh with the schools that they attend they don't have after school programs and so they were created for those kids in mind fantastic and yeah this is a great segue to kind of how did this come about from birth from your heart <laughs> Well, it came about actually after years of volunteering with young children, um, because what I realized is that when you volunteer, especially with through an organization, you don't get to see the real realities of these children's lives with the stresses or the traumas or the uh, inconveniences that they just have to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. And we're there for an hour or two to cheer them up and to do something fun or engaging or enriching, um, but that's it. We don't really see the full picture. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that I was a teacher's assistant for um, a K through two class in a charter school in Austin and uh, it turns out that this charter school allowed you to like engage with families. And I got to know a few families and one in particular that really had very severe hardships. And it was really um, not so much shocking, but more like distraught over how extreme poverty can affect a family's life. And in particular, these two, well, it was a three children family with the mom. Um, and we know how difficult it is for a single mom just to have a family and try to uh, keep that all together. And so they, you know, had all the uh, government subsidies and everything, but no car, no uh, any kind of convenience because um, unfortunately, the mom um, had a drug problem. And mm -hmm. so it brought down the family even further. Mm -hmm. The mom had been brought up in poverty. That was something that she knew. She grew up in public housing. It wasn't anything that was unusual for her to question that maybe mm -hmm. that wasn't the best thing mm -hmm. uh, in general. So the kids that I thought of 
when I saw them sitting around after school with nothing to do but get into trouble, I thought, you know, I bet you there's a lot of other kids that are in this situation and I'd really like to help. So I helped that family for, well, quite some time, but uh, just in a lot of attention and resources and having some fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized that I could do something more. I had the capacity to do something more mm -hmm. and I didn't know how much. And, you know, the uh, time frame, three to 6 p.m. after school is definitely uh, an at-risk time mm -hmm. where kids are <laughs> introduced to many things that we don't want them to be introduced to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was really afraid that, especially with this family, that they would, uh, you know, succumb to some sort of drug situation because of their mom. Um, so anyway, what I realized is that uh, to do this in any kind of uh, fashion that makes sense that I'd create a nonprofit and have after school programming and that's as far as I got and then I realized later on that it's a lot more than that <laughs> you jumped in with your heart and grew it from there instead of um creating a gigantic plan and you know you followed your heart right which yes which you know I know that hasn't been easy but wow <clears throat> the impact you are making is huge um i i wanted to mention that you were talking about breaking a cycle of poverty with that family. yes and that is super super important i know that there are lots of nonprofits out there some that i've interviewed where they really focus on a two generation support system and i know austin kids can also does co uh, communicate with the parents you get them educated right. on, on what's going on as well not like fully but you you know it's not just the kids it's also educating um the parents as well yes in fact you know sometime in the future we would like to have parental um parental <laughs> involvement in in a more formal fashion in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. sense of uh you know financial literacy things that are related to job creation, because what I saw firsthand was that there were many people that had children that once they got out of their uh, subsidized living situation, mm -hmm. they couldn't mm -hmm. rise up enough mm -hmm. to be able to survive mm -hmm. above the poverty level. Mm -hmm. um, right. and, and so, you know, they call it the cycle of poverty and unfortunately, many people that grow up in poverty, the parents, uh, their children, 45% of them will grow up to live in poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's an awfully ambitious um, idea to, you know, uh, eradicate poverty, uh, even in Austin, uh, just a little Austin. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that you can make a difference. One child and I do, at a time. Yeah. And yeah. I do agree that it's the whole family, really. It's the second generation, the two generation, mm -hmm. uh, which we aspire to be at some point mm -hmm. um, because it is so important. If you don't have the parental involvement, right. support, understanding, resources, right. they are a disadvantage. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so, I was able to interview one of your instructors. So the, the structure of, of AKC uses volunteers and actual paid instructors. Can you talk a little bit about the structure? And I'm gonna shut my door in case someone bothers. <laughs> Good thing I wore pants. <laughs> okay, so just kind of talk about what the structure of what you're offering in the afternoon Oh, oh as far as the classes? Yes, yes. Sure, absolutely. So at 3 p.m., our students dutifully show up at the cafeteria <laughs> to have a snack, to catch up on their homework, 
And after that, they get to go outside and play for like 15, 20 minutes, get their little hearts running and mm -hmm. get that little energy going. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have uh, 15 minutes of enrichment and excuse me, excuse me, social emotional learning yes. uh, that we have an activity um, of some sort that explicitly explains how children can manage their own emotions, can uh, get along with other kids, mm -hmm. can also, um, let's see, uh, sorry, my dog is here. Uh, <laughs> Was it, Emilio told me a little bit about the um, ethical dilemmas that they have with the older kids. You, they talk about ethical dilemmas. Like if you found a bunch of money or something like, Oh, yes. We call them conundrums. Conundrums. I th That sounded fantastic. Again, those are gifts you're giving them um, that will, they probably continue to think about those throughout the day and share. I think so. And the good thing is, is that uh, we are getting their minds going, but in a way that they, you know, enjoy mm -hmm. or are interested in instead of, oh, this is social emotional learning. I really don't care about that. Boring. Boring, especially when they have it in during the day right, as well. Right. So we try to differentiate the uh, curriculum mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's a short 15 minute activity, mm -hmm. but it instills all sorts of different concepts mm -hmm. of, you know, empathy, mindfulness, um, to name a few. And we've got about 18 areas mm -hmm. that we try to cover in a semester. Mm -hmm. um, so go ahead that's a lot well that's a lot and then we have so we have SEL instructors social emotional learning instructors that also help out with like behavior management nice <laughs> um, and then our coding instructors we have Emilio and we have Rohit and uh, Bob also now and they are responsible for really getting down to the nitty gritty and teaching the coding from our curriculum code.org, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a web-based um, program where kids play video games and puzzles. And so it's fun for them, unless it's hard. Once it starts to get hard or challenging, they don't mm -hmm. want to work on it anymore. Mm -hmm. So we encourage them mm -hmm. to have uh, persistence and perseverance uh, to, you know, take a second, think about what they're doing and maybe see it in a different way so they can apply those concepts, uh, coding concepts, and then move forward with the problem or the puzzle or the video game. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah, it's a lot uh, for two and a half hours because we also have what we call at the end um, an optimistic ending. And what that means is that we encourage the kids to look forward to our next class. And so, something that happened during the day or something funny, uh, something to associate, you know, coming back and seeing us and learning again is what we do at the very, very end of each class. And then they are mm -hmm. sent out to be picked up. <laughs> I, I love that so much. Um, I think we can all benefit from an optimistic <laughs> ending for sure. Yeah. Wow, wow. Hold on one second. <laughs> it's the way it works, guys. Our, our fur babies, they wanna, they wanna participate. You're outside. <laughs> That's all good. That's all good. Yes. Fantastic. So um, I had written down what my next question was, but so this is, this takes a lot of work, people, manpower, resources, planning, meeting, so much work. And so this is where I want you to tell everybody that watches, how do you keep the lights on there at Austin Kids Can? How, how does that work? What kind of support can we give you now? Brian, that's an excellent question. 
<laughs> we um, keep our lights on by really having unrestricted funds, uh, which means that, so when people donate, they usually wanna to donate to our programs, which is totally understandable. Um, but the kind of the nonprofit myth is that it operates on its own without support for their overhead expenses. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you know, general administrative office expense, supplies, uh, insurance, things of that nature, and it adds up. Mm -hmm. And so when you have grants or donations or funders that specifically want to support one particular program or another, we are restricted to make sure that those funds do just that. Of course. And so um, fundraisers are a good way to um, grow unrestricted funds. We have, we earn program fees from the schools in most situations. And so that adds to our unrestricted fund account, let's say, okay. uh, but we'd like to have our organization run more like a for-profit in the sense that we aren't necessarily looking to make a profit, but that we have cash reserves, there aren't cash flow issues that we have to be nervous about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I believe that it should be pleasurable to be involved with a nonprofit and the uh, stress of cash flow um, and not knowing if you'll be able to you know, meet the next five months expenses mm -hmm. is a little disconcerting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so my wish is that people understood better that they could donate and support any nonprofit organization by also providing funds for those types of situations. And how, how do we do that for Austin can, can in particular? You can make a donation without any restrictions and uh, may even make a note on restricted funds, but just a donation that doesn't have a program mm -hmm. that's associated mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And they can go online to our website and do mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. or send a check or call us or, mm -hmm. and we can do it by credit card. But um, so it's essentially just not making any restrictions on the donation. Exactly. I think that's a great way you put it. Like people don't really think about nonprofits as business entities. They right. think, oh, it's, I don't think anybody thinks that nonprofits like float along easily, but I don't <laughs> think people really realize that it's a strong back end with any business. If the back of the house <clears throat> isn't able to keep things going, you know, stuff's going to break, right? You know, the, the right. front of the house can't be, it, it needs its support, right? Yeah. Um, so I know that most nonprofits have a, they have a donate button now, definitely on their website, on all their social media, like and follow Austin Kids Can and your other favorite nonprofits to also spread that word, right? Because it's about, yeah. Have you had any media lately that you would direct people to check out? Oh, you're asking me? Yes. Oh, yes, actually. <laughs> Unexpected well, question was, alert. <laughs> it was uh, back in February, actually. It's been a little bit, but um, we were asked by Spectrum News to do a story on how our programs affect the students and what kind of impact we're making in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we have a star student that was the star of the interview, so little cute. Juan at third grade, started out with absolutely no coding experience whatsoever and is top of the class. Not that that matters so much, but that he's accomplished so much in such a short period of time and he can explain it well. Mm. To mm. others what he's doing and so he's helpful with other students in the class mm. uh, he's not shy he is uh, willing to explain something that somebody else doesn't understand which happens you know more than once or twice mm -hmm. in a class yeah, for sure um, and so the news story was really about uh, you know how they're learning coding uh, in an after school program that's you know geared toward children who are 
economically disadvantaged and wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to have that experience. Mm -hmm. And you have a clip of that on your website as well? Well, we're going to. Okay. We're a little slow. <laughs> Back-end issues. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, actually, our IT wow. person is on a month vacation. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yes. So well, but we'll get it on there. Absolutely. That was, a, that was a wonderful um, clip, and I, I thought that went great. Um, oh, maybe thank that, you. That leads us to talking about maybe a success story from... Uh, Emilio told us some as well. Um, oh, did he? Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did you well, have I can tell you, to share? Well, one in particular, only because he was like, he was the only student in the class that when I said, oh, we're going to be on TV, and I thought everyone was going to be excited. And it's like, oh, no, really? And Juan raised his hand to say that he wanted to be interviewed. And so that's, but... Aww. It brought out a lot of growth that he had um, really accomplished and the achievement of just fully understanding these concepts, which are not easy. No, and, it's a uh, language. Coding <laughs> it's a different is a language. language. Yes, it is. Right. And right. they learn uh, what's called block coding. And so rather than using numbers and figures, uh, they use blocks that they drop and drag uh to um drag and drop <laughs> uh in drag drop whatever drag drop yes. <laughs> fortunately i'm not the one teaching right, um, yeah. <laughs> but they use these uh blocks to uh create code and they have ways to identify if they're doing well or if they need to change something mm -hmm. um but Another success story really is our instructors. We, half our instructors are, uh, let's say either college students or just out of college. Um, now they have computer science backgrounds. That's why, you know, we hire somebody or, you know, folks that have the computer science background, mm -hmm. but they've never really, maybe some have been teachers before, but they, grow with the children as they um, teach them the concepts. It's like a little relationship <laughs> because, you know, the instructor has the answers and it's a challenging situation. It's not just like yes or no questions. It's like problem solving mm -hmm. and critical mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of makes an instant connection with the student, which is great. Mm -hmm. And so I would say overall, our instructors are doing a fabulous job with our students. And in turn, the students are really growing and um, achieving uh, important information. I, I highly encourage anybody who's watching this to definitely follow up with my interview with Emilio. He's one of the instructors and I won't spoil it because the story he told about one of the kids, um, it was a girl is really a really heart lifting story. So um, highly recommend that you watch that when it comes out next Thursday. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you about yet that you would you know like to share? Um, I think we covered it. I wanted to just uh, kind of focus on our mission. So our mission really uh, is to empower young students who are economically disadvantaged in Austin by providing after school programs in computer science coding and social emotional learning. And by that, they build emotional resilience, self-confidence, and a foundation of technology skills. And so that's our goal. And we are able to measure uh, if we are accomplishing that goal. And it's such a overwhelmingly uh, meaningful experience mm -hmm. to be with the children and to realize that this could possibly change their lives. I mean, there's many kids that are wouldn't go into coding or computer science maybe later on, but you know what? At least the introduction to it gives confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just got goosebumps and I'm sure anybody that is watching as well 
just listening to your mission statement and how you're actually impacting lives one youth at a time is fantastic. It's fantastic. Oh, I mean, Austin kids can. I mean, I thank love you. that. I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> they can. They can. That's right. What's that? There's a quote that says, you either can or you can't. And you're right. <laughs> so if you like tell that. Me, yeah. So Austin kids can. That's a positive message. I love that so, so very much. So, um, well, I think that this is the perfect amount of time. Um, I am so excited Great. to be able to visit with the founder and executive director of Austin Kids Can, Donna Raskin, for the second time. Um, <laughs> I think the last time we were I we were elbows and eyeballs deep in real COVID. So it's so nice to look at moving past that. Is it, aren't we all afraid to even say these things? But, yes. you know, it's, it's nice um, to not be scrambling to change everything to right. virtual. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, if this triggered your interest, please go to austinkidscan.org. They will be hiring new instructors very soon for the fall. Yes. 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 So get, you know, if this is exciting to you and maybe you even wanted to learn a little more code yourself, would that be appropriate? If, you know, someone was coding curious to volunteer with Austin Kids Camp? Um, the volunteers that we have actually do have coding experience. They're usually software engineers or something like that. Um, it's just important for everybody to have a little bit of background, real life background to help the children because otherwise, like from, for example, I don't have a coding background and, you know, sometimes I struggle to teach a child a concept because I don't know it that well myself. But we're learning together, and that's a good thing that the children understand that we're learning together, and it's okay to not know. Brilliant. It's brilliant. Well, everybody, thank you for watching today. I know that this world is so demanding of your time and attention that I'm very, very grateful that you spent some time with us today. And um, don't forget, there's a lot of beautiful interviews on the Nonprofit Shoutout Interview YouTube channel subscribe while you're there and we the nonprofit shout out interview is dedicated to getting smaller nonprofit uh, nonprofits in the central Texas area some exposure so people know um, just what amazing work is going on by the little people we all know about the big ones goodwill and central Texas food bank but there are so many boots on the ground um, one child, one mother, one homeless person at a time. So I hope that, that you learned something today and you like and share what we've got going on here today. So thanks, Donna. Thank you, Ryan. And you bet. Thank you, guys. All right. Take care. See you next time.